My name is Doug Kaufman. For the past 40 years, I've dedicated my life and even my career to finding the root cause of disease. Join me and a team of physicians, pharmacists, and scientists. And soon you too will know the cause. And welcome back. Good to see you again this afternoon. Thank you for joining me. My name is Doug Kaufman. The show you're watching right now is called Know the Cause. Understand why you're having symptoms or health miseries. Always work with a doctor. Let this show help you out also. Today, three topics we're going to cover. Uh, number one, there seems to be a few ways that once fungus is on board, it can injure you. So we're going to discuss that. Then we're going to talk about how difficult it is to diagnose. And I want to introduce you to a testimonial that may make you cry. It did make us cry a few years ago when we got it. And finally, fungus and turkeys. What do they have to do with one another? I think you're gonna love another testimonial we have in there from Peggy. All that and more on this Know the Cause. Let's start with ways once fungus is on board, it might hurt you. And we've talked about how it gets on board, folks. We've had uh, many discussions on that. But once fungus is in your body, you know it can off-gas poisons. We call these poisons mycotoxins. So let's start at the very beginning here. All of us are exposed to mold. Mold and fungus are ubiquitous, right? All of us are exposed to mold. Here are some of the ways that uh, we become exposed to it. Our air might have mold in it. We've discussed that. Our food might have mold in it. Very common, by the way, on some grains, especially corn and wheat. Some medications, like antibiotics, are actually made of mold. So there are ways that we're being commonly exposed. In the old days, if you're old like me, you remember Mrs. O'Leary opening the window at school and the air would blow through the schoolhouse and so forth. Little bees would come in and flies. We didn't care back then because the air would blow through. Then we have these huge HVAC systems, heating and air conditioning units, that recirculate indoor air. If there's mold or if the house is leaked, it's just picking up that mold and recirculating it. So since the advent of HVAC systems, we find many people have what we call URIs, upper respiratory infections. And when doctors hear the word infection, they automatically think antibiotics. Not true anymore. And more and more organizations in the US, in medicine, pediatricians, pulmonary specialists, they're shaking their fingers at their peers and saying, stop writing all the antibiotic prescriptions. Couldn't these be fungal infections? You bet they could. I'm involved with a couple of doctors right now writing another research paper where we're going to prove that 70 to 80% of lung infections, <coughs> cough, hacking, bringing up stuff in the morning, isn't bacteria at all. It's fungus. You might recall I brought you that paper from 1999 out of the Mayo Clinic out here in, uh, in the U.S. that discovered that 96% of chronic sinusitis, when we talk like that, 96% of that is mold. Here's the sad news. 100% of doctors, well, that's not true, 96% of doctors prescribe antibiotics almost assuring the chronicity, the chronic problem we have with sinus problems. Now, lung problems. All doctors, when they hear itis, you know, you have pulmonitis, a, a, a respiratory infection, doctors are writing prescriptions for antibiotics without finding out if that's fungus or bacteria. So we're exposed to this mold in uh, many, many ways, okay? Next, we have how that exposure might injure us. There are three known ways that mold can injure humans or animals. <clears throat> Much of the research, folks, is done on animals. It's cruel to put people in a room and blow a aspergillus mold around and see if they get sick. They do this with animals. And uh, how I wish that information had gotten into doctors' offices more than it has. This isn't a minor problem. This has become a major problem. I think part of the reason we're seeing antibiotic-resistant infections is because we're using antibiotics for fungal diseases. And I think that mutates the fungus and makes it ugly, and now it won't even respond to antifungal medicines. We are indeed seeing antifungal medicines that don't work for fungal infections. And we're surely seeing antibiotic prescriptions 
and the bacteria has mutated and it no longer works. How did we get in this conundrum? We have over-prescribed antibiotics. And don't take that from me. Read any medical journal and they'll say, we got a problem here. A good thing 60 years ago has turned into a bit of a nightmare for many, many people. Okay, the three ways that fungus might hurt us. Number one, as you know from watching this show the past couple of months, fungi cause infections. Some fungal species like Aspergillus, Candida, Cryptococcus, Histoplasmosis can cause serious and sometimes life-threatening infections. And by the way, <clears throat> this is from our U.S. Center for Disease Control. They're saying this. Uh, when you don't respond to an antibiotic in a short period of time, please, they implore you, tell your doctor, think fungus. Okay? The second way, fungus can cause allergies. Uh, fungi produce many allergic, uh, these are allergenic, uh, allergy-causing compounds, which can worsen or cause asthma, sinusitis, and other allergic conditions. So understand we're out there to be injured. We're vulnerable, no matter how strong our immune system is. Thank God for strong immunity and youth. Uh, and no matter how strong it is, if you are chronically exposed to fungus, remember what fungus do, most of them impede your immune system. So whereas today you may be immunocompetent, have a good immune system, six months from now, if you live in a moldy home, you could be immunocompromised. Then you get the flu every year and you don't feel good and you're worn out and tired and now your muscles hurt, you're depressed, etc. That's the way fungus works on the human body. It's really insidious, it's ugly, uh, and there's not many people talking about it. Uh, I thank God I've gotten this knowledge to pass along to you. Finally, fungi produce poisons. They're called mycotoxins. About 300 fungal species produce these mycotoxins. They are poisonous solids gases, or liquids. They come in many shapes and forms. Each fungus can produce one or more of these poisonous substances, so hundreds may currently exist. We think today about a thousand of them exist. We know with precision of the million and a half fungi out there, about 300 are pathogenic to man. They're pathogenic because they make these poisons, and now you know we inhale them, they can cause allergies, uh, they can grow on our skin, they can get in our lungs, and now they make poisons, and poisons definitely injure and kill us. Okay, this I want to pass along to you, and then in the next segment I want to bring you a testimonial that still, a couple of years later, floors me, but fungi can produce many symptoms and are found to be the cause of many diseases of unknown origin. Many medical charts say, we don't know what's wrong with you, but you definitely got something. Fungi can cause ringworm, so minor problems, nail fungus, or in extreme cases, it kills human beings. Kills about 1.5 people, 1.5 million globally a year. We must be vigilant about minimizing our exposure <clears throat> to these disease-causing fungi. How do we do that? You can't stop inhaling. You live in a home. Uh, you may be a tenant in that building. You can't go to the owners and say, hey, there's some mold growing in my house. Or can you? Folks, it's all in how you approach this. You know, I've been going to the doctor for respiratory problems ever since I moved in here. Could there be a mold problem here? Oh, oh and by the way, here's two papers from scientists in my country saying that mold causes problems. All you need to do to get those papers, it's relatively simple, go to PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D dot gov. That's in the U.S. Uh, many, many papers talk about how mold can be inhaled and injure you. Folks, then avoiding foods that aren't impregnated with mold. You've already learned peanuts, wheat, and corn, so grains in general tend to be impregnated with these molds, and if we have a mold problem, they tend to feed it. So you have to be careful. Minimize your exposure. Once again, be outside. Vitamin D converting to good antifungals inside your body. Proper foods from the garden to your table. There's many ways we can prevent uh, mold from taking hold. Okay, now, when we get back, how difficult are fungal diseases to diagnose? And then I want to meet you, uh, I want to introduce you to a friend. I'm not old. I may be one year young, okay? I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, I think it was about three years ago, and uh, I got on Doug's diet. I 
heard about him anyway. So the doctor wanted to give me several different shots or have an operation, take these seeds, and I said, no, I'm not gonna do anything. So I got on Doug's diet and I went back in six months. And he couldn't find anything. So my brother, he was diagnosed the same as I was. He had an operation and he's having all kinds of problems now. Real strong on Doug's side. I, mean, I don't fall off of the wagon, but I stick right to it. Nothing to it. Doug just, I think he's, he's a gem. I've got three or four of his books and I watch him quite regular on, on the Dish Network, Sky Angel, and I'm really thrilled with what I hear. Uh, that's about all I, I can report anywhere right now. Here's my trusty old book, Clinical and Immunologic Aspects of Fungal Diseases. Is that a beat up book or what? 1957 out of Johns Hopkins, it was a medical textbook that one of my, one of the doctors I worked with clinically uh, in his practice for years, when he passed, his wife gave me this book because I was opening it all the time. Folks, in this book, I just wanna, I wanna teach you, this is a book on skin diseases caused by fungus. He was a dermatologist. In this book, I made this graph. Sometimes I show this to doctors, but I want to teach you. On page 11, pulmonary fungus is suggestive of metastatic malignancy, of moving cancer, and yet it's fungus. A different fungus on page 115, localized cutaneous blastomycosis, is frequently mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. How many of you have had that? And the doctor says, well, it's exposure to the sun. It's exposure to mold, according to this book in 1957. Page 153, disseminated histoplasmosis, a different uh, fungus, is found to coexist with leukemia, lymphosarcoma, sarcoidosis, and Hodgkin's disease much more frequently than is statistically justifiable based on just coincidence. So we see all these patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukemia, lymphosarcoma cancers, Oh, they just happen to have this fungus in their bloodstream also. Coincidence? Or did that fungus contribute to those cancers? And uh, page 175, disseminated cryptococcosis, that's a different type of fungus, closely simulates neoplasms. Again, the book is Clinical and Immunologic Aspects of Fungal Diseases, circa 1957. I'm going to tuck that back in because through the next few months, you might have that on the screen again and again and again. My point is, <clears throat> fungus was in 1957 and is today in 2019, will be in the future, a mimicker. It's a masquerader. Since it isn't taught in American medical schools, uh, doctors are confusing fungal diseases with other types of diseases. Okay, it's really interesting if you watch the history of this. If you begin watching the history of fungal diseases, it just boggles your mind how often they are misdiagnosed. And that is injurious to many, many people, okay? That could get ugly. Now, here's a graph I'm gonna show you. Fungal diseases are difficult to diagnose. In 2002, 17 years ago, the medical journal Chest described the fungal disease pulmonary blastomycosis as the great masquerader because it mimics other diseases. And nine years later, an Indian study published in the Indian Journal of Cancer referred to a different fungus, this time aspergillus, as the great masquerader for the exact reason. Fungus mimics so many things. Folks, what if it mimics high cholesterol? Did you know that statin drugs are antifungal drugs? They kill fungus. Oh, by the way, they also take your cholesterol and triglycerides and lower them. Did you know that gout medicines like colchicine have antifungal properties? Could gout be a fungal drug? Did you know that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, uh, these are antidepressants, have antifungal properties? Could your depression be due to fungus? What if you had these symptoms? You just felt funny. You were vomiting. Your heart was failing you. You had fainting spells. You couldn't handle medications. Food and tap water would make you sick. You couldn't walk. You were in a wheelchair for weeks. 
Uh, then one, one night you had a vision about fungus. I don't think that was coincidental. I think that's the good Lord. Then you learned about the phase one diet. You had muscle atrophy. This is not rare. Many people go from doctor to doctor to doctor. Michelle's story is fascinating. We wanted you to hear it. Watch this. Uh, my husband and I have been very active in Oklahoma City for many years and uh, just started feeling kind of funny and by Christmas of 06, Christmas Eve, I started throwing up and uh, within about four weeks I started having heart failure. I was admitted to the hospital after several tests. I had a heart catheter and there was no blockage. Um, several IVs, a lot of fluid, and I seemed to be better. But through the year, I began to have fainting spells. And um, by the holidays of last year, uh, I was very sick. I could not drink tap water. I could not take over-the-counter medication, prescription medication. Food made me sick. And I was having tremors, um, just very, very weak. And um, so we went to a prominent clinic. Uh, in the northern part of the United States uh, because our doctors recommended that we try to find something to, you know, to help outside of Oklahoma. And they were unable to help me. And so um, after several rounds of being in the emergency room, I came home in a wheelchair. I could not walk. I could not brush my teeth on my own. I had not washed my hair in two weeks. Um, and there was just no hope. And so my husband and I began to just pray differently about what, what is this? And I, I began to have dreams uh, about fungus. And my husband had a phone call from a friend from third grade who we had not kept in touch with. And when he heard what was going on, he mentioned Doug Kaufman. And I vaguely remembered something about 10 years ago about a connection there. And so we ended up um, learning about the phase one diet. I had just come out of physical therapy, 10 days in-house in for physical therapy because I could not walk anymore. My muscles were atrophying. As soon as I started the diet, um, within about a week I could sit up. Within um, a couple weeks I could walk to the restroom on my own. And uh, within about a month I was washing my hair again on my own and walking. And um, I'm driving again. So we're still not out of the clear. I still have some symptoms, but I know it took a while to get here. It'll take a while to get out. But um, the phase one diet, eliminating, feeding whatever yeast or fungus infection is in my body has eliminated a, a cyst on my ovary, um, heart palpitations, so many different symptoms that we just could not find the answer to. And I'm on the road to recovery. And I'm grateful to Doug Kaufman. I'm my family is eternally grateful and it has made a difference and so I'm living proof and I'm thankful for it I'm thankful for um, the information and I'm thankful to the Lord for revealing all this to my family so I'm on the road okay uh, I can watch that a hundred times and I have the same effect I get a little teary it's amazing what some people go through when the etiology is fungus, okay, look at why. Fungal mycotoxins can be estrogenic, endocrine disruptors, what is diabetes, cause cancer, carcinogenic, mutagenic, mutate our DNA, tremorogenic, so our hands and feet tremor, our gait is off, teratogenic means it's poisonous to an unborn fetus, toxic to our genes, toxic to our nervous system, our kidneys, hepatotoxicity means liver toxicity, toxic to our blood, hemotoxic, toxic to our heart, our lymphatic system, our skin, and as I mentioned earlier, some of these, most of these, suppress your immune system. So it's no wonder, folks, that we have a huge number of patients. By the way, these patients, when I go into the clinics and work with these doctors, their patient charts say, etiology unknown. Know the cause is the name of this show. Etiology unknown means, yeah, they definitely are bleeding from their nose all the time or they're coughing up blood. We don't know why. So figuring out the etiology of your health problems is something only two people can do. One is a licensed physician. The other is you. Go back to when it started. 
when did it start? Were you exposed to mold, eating lots of corn, etc.? You can probably uh, figure it out. Now, when we get back from this short break, turkeys and mycotoxins? What's that all about? I'll be right back. So we're definitely all under a good amount of stress these days. So my top four tips to reduce the stress. Number one, sleep. I know we don't think we have a lot of time to sleep, but sleep is really important and helps you to be more productive. So try to get your seven to nine hours if possible. Exercise. Exercise, just getting the blood going, helps you detox a little. Just, you can do it in your apartment, home, or outside, but just get exercising. Phase one diet, a good whole food based diet, eating lots of fiber and good fats and your meats um, and your berries and things like that are going to make you feel so much better and they impact your mood and your stress in a big way. And then last of all, prayer. You can't forget prayer. That really helps me to calm down, get perspective and decrease the stress. You know, as I read this book, sometimes I take it on airplanes, 1957. There is reason to believe that systemic fungal infections have been becoming more prevalent recently and that they will probably continue to increase in incidence. Circa 1957, antibiotics were introduced 10, 15 years earlier. When you see antibiotics introduced, you begin to see fungal infections, fungal infections, and so forth. Look, antibiotics can be life-saving. If your doctor tells you to take an antibiotic, take it. But if in a couple of weeks you're not feeling better, suggest an antifungal. I think many infections are of fungal etiology. Okay, now, um, turkeys. This is the most fascinating story. First, I'm going to show it to you graphically, okay? Fungal mycotoxins in turkeys. After the discovery of penicillium, penicillium is the mold, the, the, antivi or the uh, mycotoxin it makes is called penicillin. Scientists didn't spend much time studying other mycotoxins until 1962, after Aspergillus fungus killed tens of thousands of turkeys in England. You're sitting there saying, do tell, Doug. This is the most amazing thing, folks. Um, these turkeys, for no apparent reason, young and old, started dying. And, and uh, veterinary autopsy specialists came in to look at the cadavers. Some of them had bled to death. Some of them grew lumps in their body. It was weird. They were all, and there wasn't 10 of them dying, right? There was thousands of them dying. 1962, uh, President John Kennedy was in the White House. The next year, he would be assassinated. Um, I was in eighth, ninth grade uh, during this period of time. Didn't know anything about this. But it's fascinating, folks, and all these pathologists came in and said, well, we don't know what they do. You had these brilliant minds until one day someone suggested, could it be the food? Because they've all been eating peanut meal. And then instead of examining the dead carcasses, which is what happens to us when we die, they begin to examine what the dead carcasses all ate. We don't do that in America. We don't examine what Doug Kaufman ate that could have given him heart disease or cancer or, or brain problems. We just examine the carcass, okay? But this is fascinating. Once they said, aha, the food has aspergillus mold. Aspergillus mold makes a poison known to cause cancer. It's called aflatoxin. These turkeys all died of peanut meal poisoning. Okay, what did, uh, what did we learn in 1962? that turkeys were what they ate. They are what they eat, okay? So are we humans, which is why I wanted you to meet a woman by the name of Peggy, who we met a couple of years ago, and we got this testimonial from her that I think is gonna help a lot of you. Watch this. My whole life I've had problems with asthma, allergies, depression, migraines, sinus issues, irritable bowel, folliculitis, dermatitis, eczema, you name it, I've had my bowel with just about everything. And about a year ago, I finally found a doctor who really believed that your health is 
correlates with what you're eating. So after doing some testing, we found out that my yeast levels were through the roof. So she gave me some guidelines to follow in my diet and it was all very confusing and the internet made it worse. <laughs> so I happened to go into our very small town health food store and the owner um, looked at everything I was buying and I had a book, a book about yeast and she asked if I had a problem and so I told her about it and she said, oh, well, you have to look at this cookbook and she pulled out Doug's cookbook, Eating Your Way to Good Health and I was floored for one, everything I was about to buy I couldn't eat and secondly, um, there was actually like an entire book of food I could eat which was amazing because I'd been so depressed that I couldn't eat anything. So I've been following his plan for about nine months and I did go through some die-off phases that were not the best experiences, but I survived. And after a month of phase one, I went into phase two. And now nine months later, I have no symptoms. I haven't had to use my inhaler. Everybody said this was the worst year for allergies. I never experienced any issues. My irritable bowel issues are completely gone. And through it all, I've lost 85 pounds. I feel like a completely new person. I just praise God for giving us Doug. You know, these testimonials I've seen so many times, and every time I watch them, a lump forms in my throat. What must these people have gone through after doctor, 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 doctor? Okay, many Americans, many people globally are running from doctor to doctor. If the doctor knows mycology, knows the study of fungus, many of you are going to be okay. I think it's sad that it's so often overlooked. Uh, Peggy said, what'd she say? She said, asthma, allergies, depression, migraines, irritable bowel, eczema, dermatitis, high yeast levels, and she lost 85 pounds. Why diet and supplements work so well for people with fungal conditions? Here's why. Vitamins and minerals are antifungal. Psyllium fiber binds these poisons in your gut. Amino acids are antifungal. Fatty acids like omega-3 fatty acid, antifungal. Fresh fruits and vegetables, antifungal. Coconut fats are antifungal. Spices are antifungal. Zinc is antifungal and antimycotoxin. Garlic is antifungal, antimycotoxin. Citrus oils are antifungal, antimycotoxin like D-limonene. Probiotics are antifungal. Wow. And that's just the beginning, folks. That is just the beginning. Um, so many things we eat, so many vitamins we take are antifungal. Folic acid, antifungal. And finally this, what deactivates these mycotoxins? What can I go to a health food store and get? Look at psyllium binding the mycotoxins. Look at activated charcoal, bentonite clay, N-acetylcysteine, um, alpha lipoic acid, glutathione, curcumin, trans resveratrol, chlorophyll is chemoprotective, zinc, garlic, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Amen. Fascinating, folks. Thank you so much for allowing us in your home today. Please tell a friend about Know the Cause. Give us a thumbs up. We love being with you. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.